So good evening and welcome from the Nashua River Watershed Association. I'm Martha Morgan. I'm the Water Programs Director at the NRWA. And for those of you who are not familiar with the NRWA, we are a member supported organization based in Groton. The three main focus areas for NRWA's work are land protection, education, and water resource protection in the 32 communities in Massachusetts and New Hampshire that make up our watershed. So just a, a few housekeeping items for this particular program. Um, if you were with us for the Quinnipoxic Dam removal, um, you know that that was a webinar. This, we're doing this as a, a Zoom meeting, so it's more interactive. And um, so we're just asked to, for you to keep yourself muted if you could it's, um, during the presentation. Um, you can ask questions in the chat or you can try raising your hand. And um, there are functions to, to raise your hand, I believe, to, um, to ask a question. Um, or you can just unmute yourself and, and, um, and ask. A question. Um, we will be Matt will be giving the presentation, but the, there'll be a time for um, questions during the presentation, and there'll be time for questions and answers at the end of his talk. So this is the first in a series of talks about rivers and fisheries, um, the river restoration, trout refugia in the face of climate change, the return of river herring, which is what we're having tonight, and the importance of good water quality, um, mussel habitat, and more. So. Um, the, uh, our NRWA um, website has links to all of those programs, but if you signed up for this one, you should get uh, an invitation to the next talks coming up. Two of them are in our morning talks. So <clears throat> I just want to, oops, something else, okay. Uh, these are the, the talks that we have coming up. Um, so the next one is April 6th, which is a, a wild and scenic uh, rivers stewardship um, networking breakfast that we have. And it's on uh, Sucker Brook restoration. Sucker Brook is a tributary to the Nisitissit River. And there, um, there's going to be a dam removal in Sucker Brook and a culvert replacement. So, um, and then after that, it's Tuesday, the morning of Tuesday, April 27th. Um, a discussion with two PhD students at UMass about mussels and dam removal and mussel conservation. So I do wanna thank the Massachusetts Environmental Trust who provides funding for these uh, talks and all of their funds come from the environmental license plates that they, that they have to offer. So you can get those at whaleplate.org. So the right whale or the leaping brook trout, which is on two of my cars, um, you can go ahead and, and get them there and support programs like this. And also um, what NRWA has been doing for the past year is installing, we've installed uh, temperature loggers in streams um, in primarily the Squanacook watershed, but also the Nisitissit. And um, so that's been supporting um, that work. So temperature loggers that are gonna stay in there for a number of um, years to look at uh, study climate change in rivers and trout refugia. So tonight, I'm just going to pause here and see if I have to allow anybody else in, admit more people. So tonight we have, I'm just going to make sure I can perhaps mute people. Uh, I need to. Okay, so tonight I'm going to stop sharing here. We have uh, Matt Devine. Uh, Matt is a PhD candidate at the University of Massachusetts in the Department of Con uh, Environmental Conservation Department. Um, his work inv investigates river herring population dynamics and restoration ecology throughout New England. And he uses a combination of field work, lab work, and statistical modeling to solve ecological problems. So uh, Matt received an undergrad degree from the University of Redlands in California. And please uh, help me welcome Matt to the program. Thank you very much for being here, Matt. 
Thank you, Martha, for that introduction. Can you see my screen and hear me okay? We can. Great. Well, thank you again. Thank you to all you folks for having me. I'm excited. Um, you know, it's too bad we can't be in person. I think this would have been fun if we were in person, but, you know, we're going to do the best we can. Um, and I think there's a lot of hope on the way here in terms of what's happening with the pandemic. So I hope you and your families are, are doing all right. Um, and speaking of hope, you know, what I hope to do this evening is talk to you about some of my PhD and master's research and the story of the river herring and as we know it in New England and particularly in the Nashua River watershed. So what I'm going to do in this talk is kind of discuss my master's and PhD work on the onset and then I'm going to dive into the Potanipo story and we'll focus in on the watershed and tell a little bit of that story. So um, just before I move on, I want to just highlight these couple pictures on the right here uh, is us releasing fish, little juvenile river herring from our net, our persane, which I'll, I'll describe in depth here in a minute. And on the left, really fascinating picture of a school of little river herring. Um, some of you folks probably recognize this as the boat ramp at Botanipo. And it's a big school of fish looking to get out of the pond in July. So we're gonna talk about that as we move along too. So I'm gonna dive into a lot, but I, before I do, I just wanna acknowledge um, that I am just one piece of the River Herring Research Team puzzle at UMass. Um, there's a, a big swath of advisors, project investigators, graduate students, a whole team of undergraduates who help us in the lab. Um, I'm directly advised by Dr. Allison Roy and Dr. Adrian Jordan. And, um, you know, I work on several questions that we're going to talk about today, but I just want to be clear that there's a, a big group of us here at UMass and really across the region working on river herring. So big collaborative project, fun to be a part of. Okay, I, th I thought it'd be useful to have a little river herring 101 and dive into to who these fish are and why they're important. So collectively, river herring is a term for alewife and blueback herring. These fish are managed as a single species. Um, there are distinguishing features to be able to tell them apart, but it's very challenging. Um, they occupy slightly different ranges. You can find alewife from Canada down to the Carolinas, and then you can find blueback herring um, from the Canada area down to Florida. So to give you an idea where they're distributed across the Eastern seaboard. So these fish are a, a pelagic or an open water schooling fish. Um, you can think of like mackerel and tuna, uh, Atlantic herring as pelagic and, and schooling. Um, they're anadromous, which means they spend um, most of their life at sea and then they come back to fresh water to spawn and reproduce. They're iteroparous, which means that they can make these migrations multiple times. Salmon are another species that you may be familiar, familiar with that can make these migrations to spawn several times. They can grow typically um, anywhere from 12, 13 inches maximum and um, range from eight to 10 years old. They're rather small fish, but they're very important. Um, I think they're a good looking and fascinating fish to look at. Others may dispute that, but uh, I have my biases. Um, so a little bit about their unique life history makes it so complex. Um, from the egg stage, there's about a nine day incubation period, give or take, depending on water temperature. These fish hatch and become larvae and they feed for the first three to five days or so off this tiny little ball here called the yolk sac where they get nutrients and, and food. And after that, they start to become uh, exogenous feeders or they start feeding on zooplankton and items in the water. Then they morph, um, they start to get fin structures, gain strength, begin to osmoregulate and migrate into estuaries, down rivers and into the ocean where they spend three to four years reaching sexual maturity. And then they migrate back to the 
typically the same body of water that they were spawned in. And that, that pattern is called natal homing, is where they come back to the same, the same spawning grounds. It's pretty fascinating. So why they're important, there's lots of reasons. I'll touch on a few. They're a critical food source for marine and freshwater, terrestrial and avian predators. You know, you name it, and they're going to take a bite out of river herring. We've seen um, coyotes and foxes and minks on video cameras. Um, all sorts of animals will prey on, on river herring. They're really important vectors of nutrient transportation up and down the food chain. And they have a strong cultural and economic significance dating back when they first provided sustenance um, for the very first inhabitants of New England. They are a favorite bait for lobster fishermen to, kept, to catch lobsters. And they're celebrated every year upon their return um, at river herring festivals. So I'm not sure if folks have been to a river herring festival around the region, but pretty fun stuff. I encourage you to try it. Um, you may even get a chance to try river herring um, to eat it. I don't know if anyone has, but I can say that I have. So let me take you underwater with me for a minute here and show you what a river herring run looks like. Kind of a benign scene above water and then you pop underwater. And it's this chaotic scene of adult river herring making their migration back up to fresh water to spawn. It's really fascinating. So that said, these fish have experienced really drastic population decline. Some of the causes are overfishing, um, incidental bycatch. In other words, commercial fishermen are fishing for other species like Atlantic herring or, or mackerel, and then river herring are caught incidentally. There's predation from other predators that have recovered, and there's a loss of habitat availability. So this figure I'm showing here shows commercial landings from the 50s up until around 2010. And you can see this stark decline in landings. Um, you know, this is reflective of fishing pressure and a moratorium on fishing, but this hits home the point of that decline. And if you focus in on New Hampshire commercial landings, you see a similar trend. So I like this next figure. This shows dams over five feet tall on the landscape of New England. Now, this strikes me as pretty incredible because most of Southern New England is black, which illustrates just the disruption in aquatic connectivity that has happened in the last couple of centuries. I mentioned these fish really need aquatic, aquatic connectivity to complete their life cycle. And we've disrupted that. Um, with the construction of dams during the Industrial Revolution and beyond. So there's been a, a really large loss of habitat for these fish, which has led to commercial and recreational closures. And um, these fish are currently listed as a species of concern and their stocks throughout um, many of, most of their range are either depleted or um, not increasing. They're not doing very well. So most of the data we do have for river herring come from, <clears throat> excuse me, um, adults during their upstream migration. So here in the, the map, you're looking at current and historic river herring migration routes in Southern New Hampshire. And there are several rivers that are currently monitored in New Hampshire, the Exeter, the Lamprey, the Winnicott, the Oyster, the Cocheco and Taylor. Um, and on these runs, there's a variety of methods to count these adults. So we're using electronic counters, we're using video counting systems, and we're using citizen science. So some of you on this call may have even participated in this where you sit along a stream, generally by a fish ladder or a culvert or some choke in the waterway near a dam, and you literally count these fish with a ticker as they pass. Um, and this provides all sort of really great data on things like the number of adults returning, 
the timing of these returns, and then some biological information when it's available, like the age and size structure of the fish. So we do have, have data, but there are issues with these data. They come with high uncertainty. Oftentimes there's, there's missing or incomplete data. There can be equipment malfunction. There can be what's called, what's known as double counting. So a fish may come up past the camera and then fall back and then come up again and maybe go back down and come up a third time. And so <clears throat> there can be miscounting. And then there might be large pulses of fish that we just frankly miss because they're migrating at night and no one's counting. So if you can imagine yourself, <clears throat> excuse me, on a bucket trying to look in the water and count these fish in a scene like this, well, it's probably gonna make your head spin a little bit. And you might see why these counts come with some uncertainty. So I like to show this figure and walk through to make the point why I think it's important that we not only count adults, but we do some sort of monitoring in freshwater of the juveniles. So we know that little baby river herring are born in freshwater and they're present in really high densities. They migrate out to rivers and estuaries where they, they grow larger, but they become eaten by more predators. And then they eventually make it to offshore habitats where they mingle with Atlantic herring and a few other species. And they experience mortality at every step of the way here, every checkpoint. And it's not until age three or four when these fish return to spawn. So what's missing in all of this is estimates of recruitment or, you know, you can think of recruitment or how many fish are born into the population. And so without this, it's really, hard, nearly impossible to detect where mortality is having the largest impact. And so my research said, wait a second, let's consider making counts in fresh water to couple what we know with go what's going on with adult counts. And so in fresh water, there's lots of information we don't know. There's how many fish are there? That's a large, that's a big question. We don't know how many juveniles there are. What are their sources of mortality? We've yet to really define what is suitable habitat and prioritize that. And then the, prior to what I'm about to speak to, there hasn't been um, a standardized survey protocol to get at some of these things. And so what I like to say is that there was just this big black box around freshwater dynamics. And so that's where UMass and some of our colleagues um, were funded to, to look at this, these questions specifically to freshwater. So a few of the questions I had related to this were, hang on a second, if there's no way to sample these, if there's no standardized method, let's, let's consider how we could do this. So there's lots of different fishing gears you can use to catch and sample fish. We tested a bunch out to try and figure out which one would be the most effective. How, how can we accomplish this? Fish operate, um, they have different behaviors, different times of year, different times of day. So we wanted to know when would be the best time to sample. Then of course, how much effort do we need? How, many, how much resources, how much time do we need to put in to get really precise estimates of abundance? So these are some of the questions I'm gonna go over. So to design this study, we selected 16 coastal lakes from Connecticut up to Maine. Um, I will say we now have a data set of 32 lakes, but I'm gonna speak to the 16 here exclusively for the moment. Um, six of these lakes were stocked. So in other words, fish, adult fish were transported from either below a dam or another river system and dumped into a lake um, to promote reproduction. And each lake had an estimate of adults like we talked about for, before, citizen science, um, some sort of counting method, video or electronic. And just to give a focus on New Hampshire, Patanapo and Winnesquam were the study lakes that we, that we got to in New Hampshire. Uh, 
I'm not going to spend uh, a whole lot of time here on this table, but just to say these lakes had a wide range of physical and chemical characteristics. Botanopo in particular, generally a little bit cooler than some of our studies, study sites, um, a little bit less primary productivity, lower in nitrogen and phosphorus, things like that. And those of you familiar with the a lake trophic state, um, what we did was we quantified the trophic state of each, of each lake. How productive are these lakes um, with things like phosphorus and nitrogen and phytoplankton? And so you can see that most of our lakes were either eutrophic or mesotrophic. We had very few lakes, in fact, Winnesquam was one of them, that were oligotrophic or low in primary product productivity, you know, rather sterile. Okay, so I'm gonna, let's talk about what fishing gear we tested and what fishing gear we landed on. So we started with trying gill nets. Um, if you're not familiar with gill nets, these are uh, a long net made of different size meshes along the way, different panels. They have buoys on top and a lead sinking line on the bottom, and they're stretched across the body of water, and they're let and they sit there and they're let um, to soak and sit in the water. And what fit, what happens is fish swim into these. They can't see the mesh. They get caught in their gills, um, and then you can retrieve that net and end up with something like this. Now, the issue with these nets, as you can might, might imagine, they're, they can be lethal. They're really invasive. They can catch unintended species um, and they're size selective. So in other words, they can really target a particular size of fish, which is useful if that's what you're going for. Um, in our case, we wanted to capture a wide range of sizes, so not that useful. This histogram down here on the left, you can see that gill nets captured mostly fish above 100 millimeters. That's about four inches or so. Um, so we were missing a whole cohort of fish um, that were a lot smaller than that. And the dark bars are um, from our Persane sampling, which I'm gonna touch on here in just a minute. So gill nets, really size selective, it can be lethal and then really invasive to the, to the fish. We also experimented with beach chains. These nets are largely similar in what they're made up of, buoys, lead line, uh, except the fish aren't um, gilled in the net, they're corralled into a bag in the net. So it's a little bit less invasive, it's more non-lethal, but here's how you're limited. You can only work this net in places you can stand or, or as, as much as you wanna get wet. You're really missing the pelagic habitat or that open water middle of the lake habitat. So we didn't catch a lot of river herring. We caught lots of other fish um, and we, we settled that on that this gear was not that effective for our purposes. And then finally, we tried a sonar, this really fancy acoustic sonar it shoots a beam down into the water and whatever it hits, it reflects off of and sends an image. You know, it sounded great, um, very expensive equipment, involves lots of processing time. It really could not detect these small fish. And I'll show you some fish pictures in a minute, but we were catching fish 20 millimeters, 10 millimeters. This sonar wasn't able to detect those fish. And, um, you know, I like to make the joke that it was, really hard to, detail, to distinguish between fish in the sonar and an ultrasound, which is on the bottom here. And this is my son uh, with an ultrasound picture. So it was not the, the appropriate gear for, for our purposes. So enter the Persanes. Persanes are typically an ocean going gear. They are used to catch mackerel and tuna and Atlantic herring and, and big schooling fish. And how it works is the, the net is deployed in a circle and you encircle these fish and there's a lines that get pulled and it cinches from the bottom and the fish are essentially trapped. We had one custom made for our purposes in freshwater and this is what we ran with. 
So this net um, can be set with a crew of three people. It has very, very fine mesh. So now all of a sudden we're catching those really small fish. We did this anywhere from three to 10 times in each lake each month as part of our uh, study design. So here you're seeing Ashley and Steven drop this net in as I'm circling the boat back to the buoy. Just give you a little flavor of how this net works. Um, a few more pictures you can see during the daytime, it's worked into a little circle alongside of the boat. It's cinched at the bottom here. And then the best part is these fish are corralled in a net in the lake water still along the side of the boat. And then we're allowed to then dip net them, put the ones we want to retain and measure in a bucket, and we can count and release the rest. Now this gear, as you can imagine, is um, non-lethal. It provides low stress and it's really non-invasive to these fish. So we really, we really like this gear type for a lot of different reasons. But when you're studying a species that's um, listed as a species of concern, and you certainly care about their population, you don't want to kill them. So this gear was really effective in that in that manner. Can folks see my cursor when I do this? Yes, we can see it. All right, great. So let's get into a little bit of the results. So with the when to sample, now that we know where you're going to use a persane, we wanted to figure out when was the best time in the summer to sample. And what we landed on was that early summer, June and July, have the highest catch rates. So we're catching the most fish with the greatest precision. So this figure on the left just shows you our density of fish that we're catching in the persane per across each study month. And I hope it jumps out to you that June and July we're catching the most fish, much more than um, August and September. And to hammer that point home, I'm showing you a figure now that shows the catch per unit effort. So the number of fish captured in each net haul, that's represented in these bars. And the dotted line is the, a measure of precision. So that's called the coefficient of variation. And all that is is a measure of how repeatable your numbers are. And so again, what you can see is June and July, we catch the most fish and we have the lowest coefficient of variation, which translates to the highest precision. So we're very happy with these results. Pretty clear that June and July are the time that we want to sample. But we weren't sure if it would be best to sample during the day or during the night. And it turns out that nighttime is the right time. We captured a wider range of fish at night. Here's the total length on the X, on the, excuse me, the Y axis um, in day versus night. And so we're catching a wider range of fish. We're catching more total fish and we have greater precision. So we all became night owls um, and kind of made my own bed here because the rest of the sampling I did after 2015 was after sunset. So um, we've had folks come out with us and be a little surprised that it's gonna be an all-nighter, but uh, when you have kids that don't sleep anyways, it's not that much of a big deal. Okay, and then how much to sample? This last question. What we found out is that the size of the lake really influences how much effort you need to put in. So the large lakes, and for this illustration, I'm just showing two lakes, Winnesquam and Damariscotta are these two lines. Some of you might be familiar, familiar with Damariscotta Lake up in uh, Maine. And then there's a few lakes down here that we considered smaller. And what we're looking for here is an inflection point. Where do these lines begin to flatten out? Um, on the x-axis, I'm showing the number of persane halls. So this is varying effort, right? And we simulated this to understand how much effort do we really need to put in? Can we show up and drop this net in once or twice and call it good? Or do we really need to spend a night, maybe two nights, maybe three nights at some of these lakes? And what we found is that 
these larger lakes are going to require up to 15 or so per seine halls. The smaller ones you can get away with eight to 10 or so. So these are all important pieces of information for us. And we were fortunate enough to publish this, publish this work a few years back in the North American Journal of Fisheries Management. And I'd be happy to provide this link and, and others after the, after the talk if people are interested. So we're interested in more than just counts of fish, right? There's other biological information that can be beneficial to understand growth and mortality, age and size. So we used what are called otoliths. And these are tiny little ear bones that all fish have. And they help with things like balance and hearing and predator detection, really important. Um, really important functions for these fish. And so what we did was we teased these out of their heads with tiny little jeweler forceps, mounted them on a glass slide, and then took really high resolution pictures from a um, uh, imaging software attached to a microscope. And what you're left with are these beautiful images. Of course, I'm showing you the best one. These beautiful images of these ear bones that look a lot like tree cores. And so you're familiar with tree cores and you can count those rings to determine how old a tree is. Well, you can do the same thing with river herring otoliths. You can count these rings, which are days now. These are all juvenile fish. So this is the core, day one. And these on the outer edge is where we captured and, and euthanized this fish. And if you count these, you end up with an estimate of how many days old this fish is. You can do all sorts of neat things as well. You can measure the distance in between each ring if you want to get fancy. And then you can make estimates of how these fish grew on any given day. So pretty fascinating stuff. Um, I have worked through thousands and thousands of these otoliths. And I have to say, I've, I went a little kooky. Um, I started seeing river herring otolith bands in the avocados I was eating, my desktop, and, and freshly cut grass. So a warning to those that want to get into otolith <laughs> analysis, um, it may make you a little nuts for a period of time. Nonetheless, they provide fascinating information. And let's dive into some of that information. So what I'm showing you here is growth rate on this axis in millimeters per day across just a subset of our study lakes. I want to point out Patanapo and a few other lakes because Patanapo, Pentucket, and Sabattis had the highest growth rates amongst our study lakes. Now, these ponds also had um, very, very low densities of juveniles. These ponds were also notably stocked. So these are systems where fish were taken from below a dam or another river and stocked into these ponds in very, in very few uh, low numbers. That's something I want you to keep in mind because that's going to become important here in a minute. So Botanipo, these fish experience pretty fast growth rates um, across all months, June, July, and August, relative to our other sites. Okay, so that was interesting. These fish are growing fast. Oh, and I do want to mention that before or before we sampled fish each night, we did collect information on habitat quantity and quality. So um, important things like phosphorus, nitrogen, dissolved organic carbon, chlorophyll A, temperature, dissolved oxygen, um, a measure of turbidity called secchi depth, and, and zooplankton. So what is it that causes these differences in growth among the lakes and within months? So it turns out that how many fish there are is a really strong driver of how fast those fish are growing. So we observed density dependence is what that's called in these systems. So as you have more and more fish, those fish are growing slower because they're competing for a limited number of resources. And I highlighted these red dots here, these red points just represent our stocked lakes. So 
those lakes that were stocked, Botanico, Pentucket, Sabattis, they're really driving this relationship. And we got to August and we're saying to ourselves, gosh, I mean, these fish in one pond are so much bigger than fish in another pond. You know, why is that? It, it was obvious to our eyes, but when you dove into the data, you could really see this distinction between sites like Botanico in the blue, Pentucket in the green, and then some of our other sites. Again, just a subsample here of sites, but um, when you got to later summer, later in the summer, you these differences became very apparent. So density is a really important driver of growth. But fish are, are ectotherms. In other words, their, their body temperature is driven by uh, the temperature of their, sur their sur uh, surroundings. Um, and so the master variable temperature surely played a role in their growth. And sure enough, it did. So on this figure, I'm showing you water temperature at the daily scale. So in Potanipo, we put temperature loggers at the surface and near the outlet, and we measure temperature every 15 minutes throughout the year. That's what that red line is. The black line is the measurements of each otolith band as the fish gets older. So you look at this and you can say, oh, wow, yeah, sure. I mean, temperature, um, these growth increments are reflective of temperature. And, and this is a simple linear regression that, that um, illustrates just that. It, it says, you know, 81% of the variation in growth can be explained by daily temperature alone. So now we have temperature and density as these really two important factors that are determining how fast these fish grow. Temperature is important because we're seeing rising temperatures in most of our systems across the region. This is Botanipo's water temperature for a subset of years, 2016, 18, and 19. I will note that 2016 was a, a major drought year, but we're seeing temperatures in the July 4th, mid-July region hit up to 30 degrees Celsius. I think that's like 85, 86 degrees Fahrenheit. That's bath water, that's really warm. And um, there's some work coming out of our research lab from another student who's showing that in fact, there are temperature thresholds where these fish don't continue to grow anymore and they can experience mortality or just stunted growth. So, so this is something that we're, we're tracking very closely um, as lake temperatures and drought continue to plague some of our, some of our lakes. So I want to summarize some of what I just talked about. In terms of sampling, we know that persanes are the way to go. They're effective for sampling the fish in our size classes that we're interested in. We have to do it at night and in June or July. Now, if you're interested in dynamics later in the summer, then of course, sample into August, September, October, as you wish, but June and July are really the, the sweet spots. And then large lakes, require greater sampling effort. We're kind of defining large lakes as greater than 150 acres, Botanipo right along that threshold. So as I said before, we can show up at Botanipo each month and drop the seine about eight to 10 times and have a pretty darn good idea of what's going on there. In terms of growth and mortality, um, I'll say it again, density and, and temperature are really strong drivers of, of growth. I didn't talk about mortality, but we have some preliminary data that shows if you're hatched later in the summer, you may experience higher mortality. Um, it could be due to a number of things. Those temperatures could really be playing an issue, high, high temperatures. Um, there could be a mismatch in the food that's there. Um, there could be predators that are more um, abundant during that time or at higher uh, larger sizes so they they can eat those river herring. We don't know and there's lots more work to do there, but some preliminary results. Okay, 
let's shift gears to talk about the Botanipo story now. So somewhere around 2014, 2015, Botanipo Pond was identified as a potential restoration site. I was starting my master's work, looking for lakes to study around the region, got in touch with Mike Bailey, um, who's on the call, I believe. And hi, Mike. And he is a former Brookline resident, lived right near the pond and worked for the Fish and Wildlife Service, still does. And we identified Potanipo as a, a site that we could look to restore, look to stock river herring in and see if we can um, get a river herring run started there again. So what we decided to do, we set up this stocking protocol where we stocked the lake from 2015 to 2019, getting ripe and running, or other words, adults that were ready to spawn from, I think it was the Lamprey River. I, I may have to be corrected on this, but they were taken from another river, put in a big stocking truck, driven up to the lake, um, and then dumped in the lake. And I, I love this picture because there's this, this kid here whose mind's just blown away. He's, he, he can't even believe what he's seeing with all these fish. And I think it was, really, it was a really neat day. And anytime you can get the, the kids involved, I think that's a, that's a plus. So what we did, our protocol, you can see these numbers down here. We increment, incrementally increased the number of adults that we stocked each year. And that was intentional. We were looking to drive competition. We were looking to find um, the lake carrying capacity. You know, at what, at what point do the number of adults um, hamper the resulting production of juveniles? So that was our intention. Before these fish were stocked, we measured each one, we figured out what sex they were, and we took fin clips. The idea with the fin clips was to create a genetic pedigree to basically say, you know, this off, this baby spawned with, or excuse me, came from this adult. You know, this offspring came from that adult. I don't believe those data have been used or processed yet, but they are there um, for the taking. Okay, and then we release these fish and let them do their thing. So I really like that video. That's about, that's us rele releasing the fish um, into the pond. And you see how they school up right away. It's really fascinating. You may have also noticed something hanging out of one of the fish's gills. That was a sea lamprey, um, a native diadromous fish. Um, and no, they won't bite your toes off when you're swimming, but um, they are a part of the ecosystem and have, a, have an important role in the ecosystem, just like herring. Um, and they will latch to fish. They will um, create mortality oftentimes, but again, they're part of the ecosystem um, as are the river herring. So pretty neat video there. Those adults, once they spawn, will make their way back to the ocean. And those juveniles, once they get, reach a certain size, they'll also make their way back to the ocean. And here's their, here's their roadmap. They come from the pond in Brookline, pass through Nashua, down through Lawrence, down through Lowell, and out past Newburyport to the ocean. Now, um, in three to four years, those juveniles will, will reach will reach sexual maturity and then come back to that to the same pond, right back to Brookline, right back to the Potanipo Pond. These juveniles, when they're born, they're imprinted with chemical signals from that pond. So it's 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 miraculous. They can come from the ocean, travel miles and miles back to their own spawning grounds. And I, I, I give them credit because honestly, I get lost walking around the UMass campus and I can't even find my way around. And these fish are traveling 50, 60, 70 miles back to, back to their pond. So um, I hope you can appreciate that life history characteristic that they have.
Okay, here we go. So it's it's not an easy journey. They have to pass four dams, the Great Stone Dam in Lawrence, the Pawtucket Falls Dam in Lowell, and then the Jackson Mills and the Mine Falls Dam, both in the city of Nashua. And each one presents different challenges, right? The Great Stone Dam has a, a fish lift. So these fish are, are literally swimming into a hopper and they're lifted up like an elevator up over the dam. At Pawtucket, Pawtucket Falls, they have to navigate this monster fish ladder. And then same at Jackson Mills and Mine Falls Dam, they have to navigate fish ladders. So it's not an easy journey. There's a lot of effort involved and these fish have to you know, be very fit to make this journey all the way. But here's the success story. After stocking each year, these fish did reproduce and there was no doubt about it because we caught juveniles each year. It's fascinating stuff. So the interesting thing is as we bumped up the number of fish that were stocked, the number of juveniles that we caught went down. So you can see a peak here in 2016 when we stocked 2000 adults. Now, I think some of this was related to the drought because these fish, a lot of them couldn't get out. So we possibly picked up and detected a few more. Um, but nonetheless, this trend, uh, this signal that we're seeing in this decline it is real. And this is something that we're seeing across the region. Um, I won't spend a lot of time here, but this is a, a figure from a paper that was just published by myself and some other colleagues that shows the relationship between adults on the X axis and juveniles on the Y. And you can see this pretty linear relationship here for a while. Then there's this spattering and shotgun of points. And then you can see this curve actually decline. You can see at the highest, highest adult densities juvenile production, the number of juveniles recruited actually starts to dip down. So that suggests that these lakes have a carrying capacity. You know, there is a limit to how many adults can and should be in some of these ponds. And when you, you, you plot Botanipo on here, you think to yourself, well, it looks like this pond based on this figure can support more, more adults, but there's a lot of variation from pond to pond due to some things that I'm not going to talk about in this talk. We can, we can talk about it in the question session. Um, but if, if you make this same plot for just Botanipo now, now on the left here, you can see that 2016, 2017, that year's when we stocked around 2,000 fish, you know, that may be the sweet spot, somewhere in there, give or take, because um, we started to see a decline in production after that at higher densities. And then I just want to touch on growth. Um, we, I mentioned density dependent growth. I mentioned how when there's more fish, those fish are growing slower than if there's fewer fish in the pond. And that's what we saw here. That's what we observed in Botanipo. As we increase the number of fish, our growth rates tick down from just under one to just above 0.75. Um, this is incorrect. This should be 2050. Um, the data I did not include because it's not fully processed from 2018 and 2019, but um, the preliminary data does show that growth is actually continues to go down as the number of adults um, go up. So a lot of the trends we're seeing region wide, we're also seeing at Botanipo Pond. And someone please correct me when, I'm, when we're done here. If it's Lake Botanipo or Botanipo Pond or, or some other name, because I've heard I've heard a half dozen. So um, I'm the out-of-towner, so I want to get that right. All right. And lastly, I just want to put this in context. These growth rates, you may say, well, how does that stack up to the rest of the region? And and here how's here's here's how it stacks up. Here's growth rate again on the y-axis, a bunch of our study lakes across many different years now. So again, Patanipo Pond, uh, Pentucket, and then these three ponds on the right really stand, really stand out. Now these are the stocked ponds 
And something that else that's really important to note here, these three ponds on the right, Sebatia, Robbins, and Winnicunit, are down in the Taunton River watershed down in southern southeastern Massachusetts. These ponds had dam removals in 2017. And part of my dissertation work is looking at if you install a fish ladder or you remove a dam or you essentially create fish passage, how long does it take for those systems to recover? How long does it take for river herring to repopulate that? And what are the dynamics? What are the growth rates? What are the mortality rates? And so what we're observing right off the bat is that A, these fish use these habitats immediately. You know, after, after two centuries of not being present, you give them the chance and they'll populate that. Um, and they're growing fast in those, in those systems. They're growing um, at or just below one millimeter per day. So pretty neat stuff to see these fish and, uh, and their resiliency. Now, it gets even better because we did not stock Botanipo Pond this past year. That was intentional. There was also the pandemic. Um, so it was not stocked. But we did go in October, and I believe New Hampshire Fish and Game went independently to throw the net in a couple of times just to see. And sure enough, we caught juvenile river herring. Not many. Um, but they were large and that means that adults made that journey, got all the way up past the four dams and into Botanipo and successfully spawned. So that suggests that this program is, is working, it's taking place. These fish are beginning to find their way back to Botanipo. So really cool, really fascinating. Um, we didn't catch many, like I said, but that is, very similar to what we were what we were seeing in previous years. Not many fish, but fish that were there were growing fast. So this is a great sign. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about a few issues though and ongoing challenges. One of them being flow, in-stream flow and lake levels. I don't need to tell you that fish need water, but they need it at particular times and in particular places. So those of you familiar with the outlet structure at Botanipo, you may have seen it like this, where it's raging, plenty of water. And you may have seen it like this, where there's not even a trickle going over. And this presents challenges for these fish when they, when they feel like they're ready to go. When they wanna exit the system and they can't, that becomes, a, that becomes an issue. So this is about July 7th, 2016, massive school of river herring trying to exit. I also think it's pretty darn neat how they school and how they move like a big flock of birds. It's, it's pretty neat. So I just wanted to show that video and then this one you know, this is right at the beach. There's kids swimming 20 feet away. So this is very rare to see. Um, I don't think these fish would do this unless they were stressed trying to leave the system. So you can sit there and watch that all day. Pretty neat, but there are consequences to events like that. Um, there is even more competition because these fish are trapped. They're changing their diet, eating less preferable prey items that are remaining in the lake. And they may be growing slower, entering these estuaries and rivers less fit, um, and really not transporting those nutrients back out to the ocean. So we witnessed mortality, we, we, we witnessed stranding, um, lots of schooling from three or four different sites all in 2016. And you know, we worry about this with, with climate change and, and drought forecasted in the future, um, invasive species, and, and maybe mismatches in when prey is available relative to when the fish are there. These are all challenges that these fish face, but um, you know, nothing that we can't um, work around, honestly. 
I believe that. So a couple take home messages, you know, stocking this trap and truck method, it, it is achievable. Um, and so is dam removal. Um, we're witnessing systems where these fish are using these sites right away after a dam removal, a stocking event, or a fish ladder that's been built. Um, we feel that adult counts are needed in, in concert with juvenile surveys to really fully understand the dynamics of these systems and what a pond's carrying capacity may be. You know, we know that upstream passage still presents challenges. Um, these fish, it's, it's not insignificant, the challenges that they face on their way upstream. And the out-migration, out the flows, the timing, um, the availability of water, this is really critical to their success. So um, with that, I wanna thank my funders. I wanna thank state and federal agencies who helped with this work. I particularly wanna thank lake associations and conservation commissions like yourselves who've donated countless hours um, with to monitoring, to providing technical support, to volunteering and coming out with me on the boat. Um, the work you folks do is not, um, not, overlooked, not to be overlooked. So um, I wanna leave some time for questions. There's my contact information and thank you so much for listening. I appreciate your time. Matt, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. No problem. So, Should I stop sharing my screen for now? Would that be best? Um, you might want to leave it up in case you need to go back a couple of slides. Sure. I just want to tell you that um, I've had technical difficulties. So I had my um, computer screen is frozen. And so I'm on my phone. Um, so my ability to look at the chat is not as great as it was. Oh, no, there it goes. Okay. Um, so there are, I don't know if you can, you know, look at the chat and answer some of those questions that they have, but I can read the first ones out. Um, yeah, we, we can I, do that and, and feel free to interact if people want to take off their mics and chat, we can do that too. Right. So if you want to, yeah, sure. Um, if you want, I can go through the first couple of questions on the chat and then people can open up, they can unmute themselves. How's that? Sure, let's do it. So I think you answered the first question is how are these fish getting past the dams along these rivers? Um, the next one is, do you know what the status of the Pepperell Dam passage is to the reintroduce herring to the many miles of the Nasher River through Groton and Squanicook River? Um, I think this reach would be really good habitat for juveniles and would be so great to have herring back in the upper Nashua reaches. So um, I know that when we were doing the um, FERC licensing, when they were doing the FERC licensing of the Pepperell Dam, um, I think the requirement was that, and I think Mike Bailey might be on the phone, on the, on the Zoom here, so he could answer this question better than I can, but um, I believe that 5,000 herring have to come and bump their nose up against the um, Pepperell Dam before they're required to make a fish, fish passage there. So, um, Mike, if you're on and you can answer that question. Yeah, but Martha, maybe... thank you. There was, um, it was a, a phased approach. There was not only a, uh, a count number for a number of years, but there was also a year. Um, so they weren't going to be required to build a fish ladder at least for eight years, but it's been probably four or five now. And they found a need, which was a certain number of fish pumping their nose. Uh, or counted at, at one of the fishways. Okay. All right. And um, someone wanted to you to state again what the um, species of herring these fish are. Oh, somebody answered. Mike, uh, Mike, you already answered. Alewife and blueback herring. Yep. Um, so this. Thank yous. Um, have you assessed the impact of predators? It's a great question. So I I haven't. Um, we do. You know we do quantify the fish that are there, that we also catch black crappie, largemouth bass, American eels, all sorts of stuff. And we, we measure and record those fish. I will say um, a f another grad student has assessed how river herring being present impact predators. And what we know is that in lakes with river herring, the, the fitness um, of you know that you could you could consider that the health of fish like yellow perch and largemouth bass is greater than 
the health of those same fish when river herring are not present. So that's just to say that, you know, this is a forage fish and if they're present, these predators are going to take advantage of that. Now, how that impacts the, the populations of river herring, I, I, I don't know. I don't know if I can speak to that. Um, we know that predators like striped bass have had an influence on river herring populations in estuaries and rivers. And I suspect to some extent that happens in freshwater. Um, sure, it's bound to. Yep. Bound to. Thank you. Um, so, <laughs> one of the people, um, I think there's a couple other questions here in the chat. If you want to unmute yourself and um, ask those questions that you've already asked, I, it might be easier. I think, um, let me see. I see one about how you sex river herring. Right. So when you have a river herring that's ready to spawn, you can give it a light squeeze and down near its vent or, or they'll have either eggs that come out and it'll distinguish a female or milt, which is essentially sperm and that'll come out. And so that's the way we tell most of the time because we handle these fish when they're um, spawning. So now, when they're not spawning, you know, especially these juveniles, that that's much more difficult. I, I wouldn't be able to do that, um, and that would require some sort of genetics, uh, um, I presume. Okay, thanks. So Dave Armstrong asked, um, "Did you say that you found eels in Potanipo too?" That's correct. Yeah, we did find eels, um, American eels. We caught them pretty frequently. I don't have the data at hand, but um, American eels were present most of the time we sampled in Potanipo. Yes, sir. Okay. And um, have you heard whether they're passing the new ladder in Pepperell? I have not. That's something I do not know about. Okay. I, no, I, can, is I can maybe answer that uh, question. Um, there's a couple new, the fish ladder at Mines Falls uh, was recently, it's kind of an elevator that was recently rebuilt after decades of disrepair. Um, and the one at Jackson Falls, Jackson Mills, uh, which is where Margaritas is, um, that was kind of re refurbished a bit. Uh, so there was a long time where there weren't enough river herring and people stopped taking care of their, uh, their dam assets. But in the last five or 10 years, um, different agencies got them getting it back up to snuff, realizing we were doing some restoration efforts in the Merrimack. So they were getting them up and running um, and working much better. I, I wasn't around for 2020. Um, I don't know how they ran, um, but certainly they were, they've been focusing on them more. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mike. Mike Bailey is of U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, Deb Chisholm, I think, was also on this Zoom and um, she's the um, person for the city of Nashua who is uh, doing the coordination of those, um, you know, the, the improvements to the fish ladders and, and whatnot. So um, she wants Actually, to this year we actually, um, I can give you the count numbers that we had for 2020, Martha. They're the same, that document I sent you a couple of weeks ago. We were actually able to observe at the Jackson Mill project, we saw uh, 1,100 alewives passing um, in the video system that we use, and we saw almost 1,800 at Mine Falls in 2020. Um, for eels, we had 154 eels at Jackson, and we had 124 at Mine Falls. Great. Wow. Great. Thank you. Great. Great news. Okay. <laughs> So we're at 8.06, we can keep going, you know, if people want to keep asking questions, if you keep on answering them, that's, that, that would be great. Um, yeah, question. Um, do the herring prey on insects? And have you noticed any um, correlation between insect health and per, uh, herring population? Uh, definitely no for the second question. I, I, I don't know. Um, but they, they will prey on insects, certainly. Um, they prefer little zooplankton, but I've seen fish rise into the surface. Um, I've, they, they can be taken on flies when they're available. 
Um, so yeah, they'll eat insects. Great. Um, now you can't, you can't, to be clear, you can't fish for them in a lot of places, but, but they can be taken on flies. Okay. Right. right. <laughs> can I tackle a couple of those? Um, one of the questions is how are herring going to bump their noses out of the, the pepperal dam and less stocking? Um, so the counts are actually at the dam below. Um, so, so that's how the uh, often trigger numbers will work is you don't build a, a fish way at a dam until you know the next dam below it has enough fish to make it valuable. So you're not actually counting the ones at the dam, you're counting the one hopefully at the dam below. And, and which would, what would be that dam? This is a uh, really uh, good question. That, that would be Mines Falls. Um, but uh, I, I think the wording in the license agreement um, is Mines Falls or Jackson Mills, depending on where we can get good counts. Well, you must be getting some bumps there then because they're making it all the way up to the Nisitissa. Mm -hmm. So just to um, remind everyone that there was a dam on the um, Nisitissa River that was removed in 2015. So the Millie Turner Dam, so that is also allowing more of the, um, the fish to come up uh, the Nisitissa. And I um, think that dam removal, um, and I see Michael there, uh, uh, that dam removal really helped make, make Botanipo a viable option for restoration efforts. Because if it wasn't for the effort, and probably a lot of people on this Zoom call were working on that dam removal, um, then probably nothing would have moved forward with anything uh, focused on Botanipo. Right, the Squanatissit chapter of Trout Unlimited, they did a lot of work on, on that. So, yay. So, you might just, if you don't mind, uh, didn't you, shouldn't you be getting some counts on uh, Mines, Mines Falls, Mine Falls, and it should be moving forward with putting some more pressure on the Pepperell Dam owners because, I mean, they basically blocked that entire reach of Nashua uh, for, for a century or more here. And, uh, and it's also a, uh, a wild and scenic river designation now. So there's more federal interest even than ever. <clears throat> right. Some of what you've shown here looks a lot like uh, studies that have been done on salmonids. Have you uh, talked to people who've done that work for correlation? Yeah, of course. Um, you know, similar life history. Uh, there's been, I would say, quite a bit more work on salmon than river herring. And we can look to some of those studies and methods. Uh, you know, there's slightly different spawning areas. Um, so the, the tagging, for example, it's, salmon have been tagged pretty widespread and you understand their distributions and their movement. It's really hard to do that in the juvenile river herring. They're, they're very sensitive, but it's almost like if you breathe on them, they're, they're going to turn over on you. So um, yes, but the, the, the slight differences in life history present their own challenges. So, so you have to take sam salmon life history and the studies that have been done with a grain of salt. So there's one... Oh, I'm sorry, I had a question. Oh. Um, oh, I was curious, it's Jean Navard here. Um, I was just gonna ask your question, Jean. <laughs> so I go ahead. Oh, okay. um, yeah, I was just curious if um, there's any movement to remove those four dams and those, those towns in Nashua and so on, or would that be too expensive to do? And do they have a function still? Yeah. I had the same question, so I hope I don't have to answer that one. <laughs> I can I can tackle that one. Um, so all of those dams are hydro operations, so they all produce electricity, uh, and they all produce green renewable electricity. Uh, and, and I think that's the function right now. Um, you know, when you when you look at a dam like Millie Turner Dam that no longer served. Um, the same kind of function it was built for. I think those are much easier to have the conversation about dam removal versus um, right now the city of Nashua owns a, a couple of the dams and uh, a corporation owns um, the, uh, the dams and 
Lawrence and Lowell, uh, and they're all making electricity. So the, I, I don't think that's on the table anytime in the near future. So they don't have any way around to create something that the fish could pass in a certain area, or would that be insurmountable? No, so all of those have fish passage facilities. All oh. of those four dams that make the um, hydroelectric power, often in their licensing, um, they're required to put in fish passage. Pepperell's a little bit different because it was such an old dam, it kind of got away from any responsibility up until, um, Martha probably knows it better, about five or six years ago when they got a new license and now they have some of those responsibilities moving forward. They were never licensed under FERC, they were grandfathered, so they yeah, weren't they required were. to do all that. Yeah, so they hadn't made any uh, viable improvements to their facility since it was 1912 or something. So they were grandfathered. Okay. But once they finally upgraded, then they were able to um, get a license and, and have to kind of follow the rules that modern hydros follow now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So um, I'm just looking at questions. Uh, Dave Armstrong put a couple of questions in here about mussels that alewife and eels are hosts for um, that will benefit from having herring back in the Nisitis. Are there mussels um, that will benefit from having herring back? There, there, are, there are. There's some brook floaters in the Nisitis. Um, I'm not a mussel expert, but some of those brook floaters, I think maybe uh, Massachusetts threatened or listed. Uh, and, and I think yeah. Alewives are known to be a host to that, but uh, typically because mussels don't swim well, um, they use fish as hosts to move up and down. So anytime you get those highly migratory fish like uh, American eels or, or alewife or blueback herring, it, it helps move the populations where they need to go. It's usually part of their life cycle. They have a, a, a narrow window in which they're parasitic in which they jump on fish for free rides to go where they want to go. So we have two talks coming up about mussels um, in the Nisitisit and Suckerbrook. So <laughs> look out for those. Um, so it's 8.14. So I think we're probably um, going to close it there. I think uh, there was one more from um, Dave Armstrong, just a comment about the T was noticed larger fall fish in schools of sucker in the Nisitisit since the Millie Turner Dam was removed. And he's assuming that those are coming from Nashua and from the Nashua. And on Cape Cod, coaster brook uh, trout will move coast, move into strew, streams like the Quashnet during the herring runs. Would coaster brook trout historically have moved all the way up to the Merrimack to the Nisitisset? Uh, question for, for Matt, I guess, or Mike? Yeah, I, you know, I don't know coastal brook trout, their historic range, not sure how far they'll, I, I wanna say that they'll, inhibit closer to the, the coast, but I, I, I don't want to tackle that one. I'm not quite sure. Okay. This was fantastic, Matt. Thank you so much. There's so much information here and well, listen, uh, a lot you. of work. Wow. If there's um, additional questions, feel free to contact me. I, I want to thank you all for allowing me to work in the watershed. It's been a great experience. I always enjoyed coming to Patanapo. It's a quiet little place away from a lot of these urban sites that I do work in. So, hey, th I, I'm thanking you all. Thanks, thank you guys. <laughs> well, thanks for bringing back the, the herring. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> Not just me, please. It, it's, I'm a small, small part. Yeah, you're all cog in the wheel. <laughs> all right, thanks very much, everyone. Have a good night. All right, be well, everybody. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs>